Eriso Kunis. A very warm welcome in the name of Jesus to this ancient cathedral, a sacred space, a place to meet God and to meet one another. Whether you are from the city, the diocese, or further afield, this is your cathedral. Welcome on this day as we make a sad but fond farewell to our bishop, to Paul, to Tom, and to the family. A day of thanksgiving for Bishop June and all that she has brought to the life of this diocese. Bishop June has made a difference. She has made change happen. She has set us on a course for the future. In this service, we pray with June, and at the end, she will divest herself of the signs of her Episcopal office, coming from the high altar to sit with Paul and Tom and family and friends. After that, please stay in your seats for the speeches which will be made here in the nave. Then the canons will process out, and June will then lead us to the Lady Chapel for refreshments and the chance to talk and meet informally. Thank you to our honoured guests, to every single one of you for being here in this building that witnesses to the love of Jesus. A my cariad Chris, ar waith yn omni, bydded iddo ein tawis ein gwarchod heddiw a phob amser. Beloved in Christ, we are here in the presence of the living God and of the whole company of heaven to offer to him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving that we may know more truly the greatness of his love and that his grace may bear fruit in our lives. We have come to hear and receive God's holy word, to seek the strengthening power of the Holy Spirit and to pray for ourselves and all mankind that we may be given those things which are necessary for our true well-being. But first, let us confess our sins and seek our Father's pardon and peace. We confess to God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
darlleniad cynta o'r proffwyd Eisea. Yn nawr, dyma'r hyn a ddywed yr arglwydd, ath greodd Jacob, ac ath luniodd Israel. Paid ag ofni, o herwydd gwaredad di, galwaf ar dy enw, eiddo fi y dwyt. Pan fydd hi'n mynd trwy'r y dyfroedd, byddaf gyda thi, a thrwy'r afonydd ni rythrant drosod. Pan fydd hi'n rhodio trwy'r y tan, nith ddeifir, a thrwy'r fframau ni losgant di. O herwydd, ma fi yr argdwydd dyddiw, Sanct Israel, yw dywyredydd. Rhodd yr aift yn iawn y drosod. Ethiopia a Seba yn gyfnewid amdanat. Am dy fod yn werth fawr yn y fyngolwg, yn ogoneddus a minain y dygaru. Rhodd eraill yn gyfnewid amdanat a phoblwydd am dy einioes. Paid ag ofni a rhoi fi gyda thi. Dyma terfyn y darlluniad gyntaf.
The second lesson is taken from the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, beginning at the first verse. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here ends the second lesson.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body,
prayer of St. Augustine. Grant, Lord, that I may know myself, that I may know thee. Amen. At the back of your um, service booklet is an image of the walking Madonna. Um, and uh, the walking Madonna is largely responsible for me uh, becoming a bishop and coming to Llandaff. So I want to start there. Um, as you can see, it's a sculpture by Elizabeth Frink, and it stands outside the north door of Salisbury Cathedral. It's the entrance outside the door which worshippers routinely head towards services. Now in uh, 2015, uh, Bishop Andy, as he then was, uh, will remember that he wanted a photograph of that sculpture for a book he was writing. Not only did I manage to be unavailable when he visited Salisbury to take the photograph, uh, so I offered him no hospitality whatsoever. Um, but he may remember that um, I forgot we were due to remove the statue for maintenance work just before he arrived. That inauspicious start to our relationship notwithstanding, um, Archbishop Andy, I will always be grateful to you and your fellow bishops for the invitation to become the Bishop of Llandaff, and also for your personal capacity to cheerfully forgive. Actually, that uh, rare week when the walking Madonna was removed to the workshops could have told the good people of Llandaff uh, a lot uh, more about their soon-to-be bishop. Uh, because one of the significant things about Elizabeth Frink's um, uh, portrayal of Mary is uh, its location. Uh, as I said, uh, she stands by the entrance door of the cathedral. But very importantly, she's striding away from it, leaving us to wonder what she thinks of what is going on inside the church building. Now, morning and evening for many young, long years, as I passed her on my way to prayers, I enjoyed the fact that she was heading purposefully into the city. As someone who has always felt more comfortable communicating with those on the margins or outside the church, and knowing that uh, I'm much better with those who have strayed or failed or betrayed themselves than those who live conspicuously tidy lives, uh, Mary's determination to head in the direction of those who are less sure about the relevance of the church, it really resonated with me. Imagine then this scenario. When my colleagues in the works department at Salisbury had finished the repairs to this statue and uh, its base, they decided to give the walking Madonna a new axis. Uh, we just opened um, a new tea room across from the cathedral. And so they thought it would be a good marketing ploy if they positioned Mary as if she was going to the cafe <laughs> for a nice afternoon tea. When this change was pointed out to me, and incidentally, the first person to notice it was the local MP, uh, who uh, was straight on to me. Um, I spoke with the clerk of the works. I think it is fair to say that he encountered what might be described as my commanding leadership style. <laughs> In just three words, put it back. <laughs> the walking Madonna is Mary as an older woman with shoulders back, striding with, with all the purpose of women who've suffered and endured, worn by life, but with a serenity and grace to which people can connect. 
It's an image of the walk of faith as strong, even forceful, servant but not subservient. Now we've just had that same uh, walk of faith offered to us in the story of Mary Magdalene in our second lesson. Uh, some of you will remember, in fact, indeed, some of you were here on the occasion when I first took up the diocesan crozier here in the cathedral on the feast day of Mary Magdalene. So I'm hoping that you won't mind, I know it's St. Andrew's Day, but I hope you won't mind revisiting with me uh, the best known encounter that we have in Mary Magdalene's life as I now on this day lay down that symbol of authority. One of the things I've enjoyed most as a bishop is preaching at the licensing of new clergy, putting people into jobs, jobs which are the joys and the hardships uh, of which they are yet to discover. And in those sermons, uh, and there have been a lot of them in five and a half years, I've often urged the clergy to live and preach the resurrection. So it's only fitting that I leave you tonight with the image of these uh, two women, these two Marys, both of whom embodied resurrection life, vulnerable and strong women, living in the power of faith and hope and love. Three thoughts then from Mary Magdalene as the first apostle, the first messenger of the resurrection that I want to leave with you. Mary Magdalene came to the place of her worst fears uh, before dawn, while, as it says, it was still dark. When the church first weighed up whether it wanted to trust me with ministerial responsibility, uh, ambivalent as it was then in the early 1970s um, about whether to have ordained women at all, I remember that it assessed my education, my skills, my seriousness in, in believing, but I don't ever remember anyone asking me if I was capable of courage. No one that I, I can remember put Mary's example uh, in before me and asked, are you able to set out while it is still dark? Are you able, maybe, to set out on your own? To find out what's going on? To get things done? to confront your own fear in order to do what you know to be right. No one dedicates their life to pastoral ministry, and bishops are nothing if they're not pastors. Uh, no one does that without, and uh, it, whilst being oblivious to life's toughness, of the cruelties of injustice, of the unbelievable human misery which some people managed to live through. Let's not indulge ourselves by thinking that the church is especially challenged in this day, as we know that many people turn their faces away from the invitation to worship. But neither let us indulge complacency. Rather, let us encourage each other to the courage that we need to live as apostles of messengers of the resurrection and yet to do it all with great humility. For there's another kind of darkness described here um, on this Easter morning and that's the darkness of simply making mistakes, of being fallible. So secondly, uh, we might celebrate that Mary stepped out in the face of her anxieties, but we also have to recognize that she got it wrong. Remember how she kept saying, they have taken away my Lord, and I don't, don't know where they have laid him. Uh, she jumped to the wrong conclusion that the, the body of Jesus had been stolen or that the gardener had removed it. 
But fortunately, she enlisted the help of those of others, Peter and John, to discover what was the truth. She got them, she got those two men mobilized. And between them, in three very different ways, they each became Easter people. Finally, they reached a knowledge of what was profoundly true and what has enlivened the church and society ever since. The truth that faith in God matters, that love is all powerful, and that hope endures. I guess one of my abiding legacies in Llandaff will have been to structure the diocese so that everyone, lay and ordained, works in a team. An innovation that is welcome to some, but not to all. Yet I believe that's what leaders do. They build highly effective teams. Not least because that mitigates against their own errors and mistakes. We're both safer and more imaginative if we stay close to the wisdom of others. Let me say this now. I've never had a single original thought in the entirety of my ministry. I have happily stolen every good idea I've ever had from the wonderful people I've worked alongside. So if Mary was to discover what was true in her life following the brutal death of Jesus, she had to do two things. She had to stay in the place of that lived reality, ama or heed, and she needed others to do it. Particularly, she needed Jesus, and she needed her relationship with his followers so that she was able to discover for herself a more radical truth, a more radical reality. Thank you, Team Llandaff, for as I've shared my oversight with you, you've generously helped me discover deeper truths about myself and the God we worship. So there's two elements of Christian ministry. Courageously to stay with our lived reality and seek truth through our worship and our collaborative life with others, even with those with whom we disagree. But thirdly and lastly, where does the resurrection transform Mary's life? Where does light enter into our life and into Christian ministry? It's in such a simple way. Jesus called her by her name, Mary. Our redemption is born when God calls us by our name. Many of you will know that a bishop repeats that claim of Isaiah's whenever he or she confirms candidates in the faith. If they let me, I look confirmation candidates in their eye and I say to them, God calls you by name, and he makes you his own. And in that moment, and on behalf of the church, we proclaim the most glorious and joyful fact that this person is known to God, and loved by God, blemishes and all. And it's in that acceptance and affirmation that the Christian is then empowered by his spirit to grow his kingdom and build our capacity for good. Jesus' invitation to Mary was that she might recognize him, to know herself cherished, and to take on the task of proclaiming the resurrection. And so by the end of the story, she no longer talks about a stolen body, but instead here we encounter her voice, the voice and stride of womanhood, the voice of the gospel. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. The church is above all the place where we personally encounter Jesus Christ, where we recognize him, 
and he in turn sends us out to do his work. Yet all of that begins when he calls our name, when we hear that invitation to follow him. Thank you, Fanda, for ensuring that I have seen the Lord. Thank you for your prayers, for your compassion and loyalty, for your willingness to take risks, for the fun and laughter we've had on the way. But most of all, on this day, thank you for your tender love for me. God bless you, Team Flanduff, as you walk not towards the sheltered tea rooms for cosy retreat with friends, but towards the world in all of its needs. For the blessings of his kingdom are for the salvation of the world. And for that, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord God, through your church you called June to be our chief pastor and shepherd, to proclaim God's word and celebrate the Son, to interpret the gospel for us and maintain the unity of the church. Through her, you have provided leadership and guidance for us in the spirit of Christ. Through her, you have challenged us with the gospel mission. Through her, you have helped us to set our direction and encouraged us on our way. And so we give you thanks for her ministry amongst us here 
in Llandaff, and also through many years of faithful service across the wider church, both in Wales and in other parts of the Anglican Communion. We praise you for the gifts you so richly bestowed on her and which she has shared so freely among us. We thank you for her wise leadership, for her compassion and care for those entrusted to her charge, for her integrity and faithfulness, and for everything that she has brought to so many through her years of ministry. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, our times are in your hands. Bless both June and Paul and the wider family, we pray, in this new season of their lives. The June and Paul's years ahead together may be long and fruitful. May they find opportunities to give time to old friendships, discover new interests, and simply to enjoy extended periods in the company of each other and that of their family. Lord, in your mercy. At this time of transition for this diocese, We pray for the guidance of your Holy Spirit, especially for all who will bear the responsibility of electing a new bishop. Through prayer and a trusting heart in your purposes for your church, may they discern the person that you call to be our next bishop. As within the diocese, we continue to tell a joyful story to help grow your kingdom and to build our capacity for good. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for the church in every place and for all with whom we share a common baptism. May all Christians be faithful to the call of that baptism passionate in fulfilling God's mission to his world and humble in serving its people. Especially we pray for your people in this province of Wales. All bishops Andrew, Gregory, Joe, Cherry and John, for Simon Lloyd and the provincial staff, for the members of the governing and representative bodies. We pray also for all who contribute to the life, mission, and ministry of your church in this diocese of Lander. Our lay leaders and clergy in their work within our ministry areas, our interim area deans, our diocesan staff, and the members of the bishop's leadership team. May they be granted unity and purpose and passion in service. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, we pray for your world which the church has been called to serve. May it know that peace which is your will and for which it so longs. Soften the hearts of your people so that we might be channels of your compassion and love, bringing aid, support, and comfort to any who are in need. Bless the work of Christian Aid, CAFOD, Tear Fund, and all those organizations and charities that seek to minister to the most deprived of people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, touch with your hand of healing and forgiveness all who are in pain. 
those who are ill, those who are anxious or depressed, those who feel that what they have done is beyond forgiveness, those whose lives are in any way disordered or broken. May they all find their wholeness in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, in silence, we now lift to you our own personal prayers for the world, for the church, for this province and diocese, and especially for June as she enters a new stage of her life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we say together the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Abendeth you, ho hachliog. A tard, a mab, a rosprit glan, a bonaik plith a cadrigo rivaqui on wastad. Amen. 